So uh, we are going to do our last lecture. This is happening again. Yeah. So today we are going to cover optimal remote sensing by small M and aircraft systems. So um, we are going to spend about one and a half hour. And uh, so the main reference is based on the two literature here. The first one is um, the tutorial on fundamentals of remote sensing. Okay, and uh, Dr. Disney's teaching module plus. Brandon Stark and myself, we wrote a framework of optimal remote sensing using a small M aircraft published in 2016. Okay. Anybody knows what is a DOI? Anything with a DOI, it is a unique label to an article. It's called Digital Object Identifier. Okay. So there is a website called doi.org, okay? And you threw out, there's a small uh, window. You threw, threw in this DOI number, will link, will bring you to the PDF of the file, okay? Of course, depending on your subscription. But our UC Merced has subscription to the all the IEEB PDF files, so it's very good. So the outline of today's presentation is about remote sensing basics. I believe that using drones, you, although I gave you the handout regarding different types of uh, drone, uh, 40 different types of drone services, and also uh, looking towards the future, uh, the using the drones not only as a data acquisition tool, but also in general ha have it as a data service. Tool. Okay. So it has to be sensing at a distance. Then it's called remote sensing. Uh, remote sensing. Okay. And if it is so close to it, there's another opposite word is called what? Proximate sensing. Prox so what's the opposite of remote sensing? It's called proximate sensing. It's close, okay, not remote, okay? proximate. But of course, there are something called contact. You contact it. So then, like uh, you have a, you listen to the heart rate. So then here is contact, by contact, okay? So you cannot imagine that uh, you, you do check the water stress of crops you, you in contact with the leaves. That's a lot of work. It's huge, so many trees. You cannot do that. So remote sensing is very important. Okay? However, when people talk about remote sensing, they usually imply by default, meaning satellite remote sensing. So that is the mainstream. So we are going to start from satellite remote sensing, then we change it to a new era. It's called drone-based remote sensing, or UAS-based remote sensing, or more specifically, small and many aircraft systems-based remote sensing. So of course, we can leverage satellite remote sensing. So I told you that when we do small aircraft-based remote sensing, that means it is accessible to a lot of people at a lower cost. So we get into what, I call, what we call personal remote sensing area. Um, so remote sensing fundamentals is regarding uh, observing the Earth. Okay, it's, uh, it's called electro-optical or Earth observation. <laughs> Earth observation. E-O-R-S, okay? 
So remotely means using instruments or sensors carried by some platforms, especially like satellites or aircrafts or hot air balloon. Okay. Usually we always think in terms of satellites, but it doesn't have to be the case. So we can use helicopters, aircrafts, and so on and so forth. So remote sensing examples including uh, uh, having a balloon and or not always expensive experiments. So we do a, a photography like kite, like uh, aerial, helicopter, or you just put inside the field. So that's also remote sensing. Okay. So. So that is uh, another picture. You hold your uh, camera and do a selfie uh, of the cross. <laughs> okay. So this is also remote sensing. Okay. Remote sensing. So we can talk about remote sensing uh, examples. But before that, we really need to talk two things. One is the platform. Okay. What carries the sensors? So what information do we want? And how much details we need? And what types of details? So, so those platform also depends on the applications. Okay? For example, sometimes people say, oh, I want to do remote sensing. We can just simply use this simple people can put uh, sensors in here. And having this uh, arm to check it out. Or you use uh, upscale and uh, have aircrafts, okay? Or you can still keep doing that upscale until the satellites. So source of spatial and temporal information for the land surface, oceans, atmosphere, ice, dynamics. Monitor or develop understandings of the environment. That is the initial so we live on this planet, we need to understand how it changes. So information can be inaccurately, timely, consistent on a large scale. Large scale, the overall Earth surface. So this EO, this Earth observation. So go back and remember this EO, Earth observation. So it's very big, Earth is big, right? So, so remote sensing uh, can accumulate historic data, okay? Uh, I'm not sure if you Google, um, Google for time, la time lapse of Google Earth. So they provide some of the old historic data and put in this uh, like a movie. So then you will be able to see how a region, a bigger uh, neighborhood, change over time. And they did this one for Las Vegas. Oh, it is so clear that it's expanding. And there's also a limit of the water supply. So they, they must stop that kind of expansion. So it's very useful for decision making. Or you can, you can check the social effect, economic effect versus or your uh, spatial expanding. So you need to do some policy change. And uh, so that's uh, right now uh, we are more on uh, quantitative applications, meaning we, are, we need more accurate information. And so say for example, climate change, okay? So climate change is a very vague term, okay? It's very vague. So how much change is considered as a change, okay? So. Uh, so we need more accurate quantitative measurements. Uh, temperature, atmospheric gases, land surface aerosol, and so on and so forth. We need all those data and see how they change. And we've got a lot of commercial applications like in the weather, agriculture, monitoring, resource management. You, you, this, this can go on, okay? So these are satellite. However, um, remote sensing has lots of uh, different issues. First, it can be expensive, okay? Next, be uh, technically more difficult, maybe, because you do a sense at a dif distance. Uh, it's not, because it's not direct measurement, you need to infer, okay? Infer, okay. 
So we need some surrogate variables okay, to interpret what's the measure. Okay? So say for example, you take a picture, see the leaf is yellow. What does that mean? What's the direct variable is responsible for that? Okay. So then in this sense, we need to check this, the, the, the reflectance for, of the air, 100% or brightness of the temperature. So, uh, so is interpreted as uh, the watts per square meter, and then infer what is the Kelvin degree. Uh, sometimes we ch talk about backscatter and how much you reflect it. So then, uh, all they related each other. Uh, so we need to infer more direct physical properties. So from this point of view. When we use a drone taking a picture, you call this is scientific measurements, probably it's too early. You have to carefully interpret those pixels values in the in the photo. Okay, in the photo. So to do that, we need to go back to the literature uh, to learn from the existing remote sensing technology. How they use the surrogate variables and convert the pixel value into a more scientific physical based physics based uh, the, the, the variables the values so to do that we need to go back to the basics understand the fundamentals of physics so the basic concepts is to understand electromagnetic spectrum okay so EM spectrum so I'm not sure you can see it very clearly. So, um, uh, so this axis is uh, using as uh, wavelengths. Okay, this is like lambda. Okay, okay, and also they can be converted as a frequency. Is uh, the speed of light divided by the lambda, divided by lambda. So the f. Okay, lambda, F is frequency, lambda is the wavelength, as uh, spectral wavelength, uh, divi C divided by lambda is your frequency, okay? So, you probably heard that this, is, this unit is meter, okay? And 10 to the power of this very small visible region is uh, like from 400 nanometer 10 to the power of, 10 to the power of, how many is nano? Minus, Minus six. six. It's micro. Micro. Minus nine is nano, okay? So minus nine, okay? Minus nine. So this is a point four, it's basically is a point four micro, right? Point four micro. So it's 400 nano to 700 nano. This is called visible band, visible band. So this is visible, it's a very narrow one from here. But there is, a, this one's infrared band is, okay, infrared band. And then here, this is called microwave band. Or then uh, for something like one millimeter or higher, this is called radio wavelengths, okay, radio, micro, Micro uh, radio waves, radio waves. Okay. So then the shorter one is ultraviolet. Is seen here because this is a violet. This is red. So infrared is here and ultraviolet is here. Okay. So then you have X-ray, you have gamma ray. It's even uh, smaller. Okay. 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 So. Taking a regular picture is basically giving you the visible band response. So go back to the slide here, talking about reflectance. Reflectance. That is the reflectance from the sunshine. Okay, sunshine. Okay. So all this sunshine is a micro, uh, it's an electromagnetic wave as well. Okay, the light. So then you have a reflectance, so you reflect. 
So that kind of electromagnetic radiation, and uh, so at a different wavelengths, okay, different wavelengths, uh, and then you can see that this is called atmospheric uh, transmissions, percentage of the transmissions, okay? okay? So at a different wavelengths, at different wavelengths, the values here is different, okay? Value here is different. So, for the wavelengths, there are atmospheric window. So we talk about visible and near infrared. Those are optical uh, remote sensing. So 400 to 700 nanometer, 700 to uh, 1500 uh, nanometer. And then, so this is a visible and near infrared. Another one is thermal infrared. is 8.5 to 12.5. Micrometers and microwaves one millimeter to one meter. So these are the wavelengths. Okay. So so give you a rough idea. So the these are the reflectant. This is the atmospheric uh, transmission percentage. So they will get through that. So in some of this, uh, they just cannot pass the the. the Atmosphere, our, our atmosphere, so you get absorbed. So here are the basic concepts, uh, basic concepts. So uh, first is regarding orbits. So you have uh, satellite geostationary at this 36,000 kilometers altitude, and that is called geostationary, stay there. There's another one is called polar orbiting. So all at uh, a lower uh, attitude, so this is 200 to 1,000 kilometers attitude. So this is orbit. Um, another one is spatial resolution, tens of centimeters or hundreds of kilometers. So it's a wider range, different. Or de determined by the attitude of satellite, you can imagine. The lower attitude, the higher resolution, right? Okay. And also depending on your speed and viewing angle. So that's for temporal resolution, it could be like minutes or two days. For the NOAA uh, satellite, it's a 12 hours, uh, okay, one kilometer uh, resolution. So. It's 1978. Modest is two, one to two days. The resolution is 250 meters. Meaning that if we use a pixel, that pixel is a 250 meter, 250 meter. This region is one point. Landsat, usually we use this one a lot. There's 16 days, okay, fly on over, and the resolution is uh, 30 meters. This started from uh, uh, 1972, but today is a Landsat 8, okay? Different generations. Many others, okay? Uh, the satellites, okay? 10, 20 meters, okay? So the re is, it needs 26 days, okay? So the revisit depends on latitude sensors, field of view, field of view, the point in direction, orbit, uh, inclination, and attitude. Also depends on cloud co cover, so for those optical instruments, the clouds will influence. So let's see this one. So the major programs in the world, different satellites. So I don't want to go through. It's mainly for meteorologic services. So like a Meteorosat, uh, GOES, and GMS, INSAT. So these are the geostationary, stay there, okay? For polar orbiting, this is the kind of polar orbiting like that. So there are many other uh, programs. So it's not just the United States, it's a global effort, okay? Uh, here comes the question regarding remote sensing. You are going to check your quiz, okay? Uh, so we're going to go through it carefully. So uh, we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. <laughs> so uh, this is a remote sensing system. Uh, so you need to have energy source. What is the energy source? It's sound. Sound is our energy source. 
And also we need a platform, which is D, okay? Platform. And also we need a uh, sensor, okay? Need a sensor. And so these are the sensors on top of that. And then we need a data recording and transmission. We need a, a, a satellite receiver. Uh, these are another satellite of transmission data. And then we need a computer to store the data and uh, to do data processing. And uh, finally, we do expert interpretation to provide to the end users. So I'm going to go through carefully. You have this figure in front of you. I'm going to do one by one. So energy source is A, here, A, OK? Energy source or illumination. The first requirement for remote sensing is to have some energy source illum illuminates and uh, provides electromagnetic energy to the target of the interest. You may say, oh, this is obvious. Dr. Chang, what, uh, why bother? We know there's a sun. Let me remind you one thing, that sometimes you need to forget about this. Uh, remember, Dr. Reza, uh, poor Reza, Dr. Paul Reza was here talking about uh, the citrus tree. You try to count the fruit and the leaf. They are both green, you cannot see them. Then how later on you can see it? What did he do? You s he sprayed the water on the, on the leaves and, uh, and the fruit. Then you take picture, then they will have different temperatures, right? Then you see what is leaf, what is fruit. Remember that? I was so impressed. So, but from remote sensing point of view, when you spray that water, that sprayer is considered as what? Energy source. Instead of sunshine, the spray of sunshine. Okay? Get it? Okay. So I just elaborate this point. So. And sometimes people are talking about fluorescence. So fluorescence meaning I have a specific light source to, to, shine, uh, to shine the light source on the leaf. The leaf will reflect respond in a different way, so you capture that. You see what I mean? So you don't have to be the sunshine, okay? So, of course, in the, in the, in the remote sensing part, this is considered as the norm for the practice, but uh, with drones, it's possible you have another drone carrying another uh, source, energy source, like laser, Okay, so you do remote sensing at night without sun. Can you? Of course possible, right? Then radiation and atmosphere, so this is the B. That energy will travel through the target in, in contact with the atmosphere passing through. Interact may take place in second time as the energy travels from the target to the sensor. So come in and come reflect back, it will be a different, okay? But for our case, you know, using drone, this B is probably not a big deal, right? So the B is not a big deal, okay? The atmosphere effect is not a big deal. Interaction with target, recording energy by the sensor, D, transmission, reception, and processing is G, okay, here. And interpretation and analysis F, F, okay, and G is the end user to visualize for the user. So I hope you can fill up that uh, form. And by the way, if this is happened in a, a final exam, I just, I just give you some of those, and uh, you fill up some of the blanks, so you should be able to do the same, right? So the physics basis, again, and let's start, uh, is measurement of the EM, electromagnetic radiation, scattered or reflected. So the energy source is the solar and, uh, and <coughs> the sun or the Earth itself. 
uh, or we do have some any artificial and sun artificial and uh, energy source. So these are the called inci incident solar radiation and reflected solar radiation. And here you have something you got absorbed. So source property vary intensity and different wavelengths. So depending on the surface property, like forest, water, grass, bare soil, paved roads, build up area or building, so they, they will have different. So either emitted or scattered. So this is transmission pass through. Scattered is just scattered. Absorbed is getting in. So reflected, absorbed, scattered, or transmission like this. So the same thing with different, uh, like ocean, you have a lot of ocean. Here you have absorption, transmission, and emitting. So three things, you either scattered, reflected, or absorbed, okay, or emitted, okay. So data acquisition, okay, data acquisition. So instrument measures energy received. Uh, the three areas of spectrum is visible and near infrared, and near and mid infrared, passive, active, Solar energy reflected by surface determines surface reflectance. For the active ones, we can do LiDAR as active laser pulse uh, with time delay. So, or we can do induced fluorescence. So, uh, so we can measure chlorophyll, okay. The second is thermal infrared, thermal infrared. Energy measured in terms of temperature of surface and emissivity, okay, emissivity. Microwave, you have active or passive as well. And we usually do not do microwave uh, remote sensing, it's too expensive, okay. So usually it's in the military applications, okay. So we are going to focus on thermal infrared, visible and mid near infrared, okay. Uh, so with that, we can have image formation. It's called photographic. So recorded on the film. Uh, so one is called whisk broom scanner. So you have a scanning, okay. Point sensor using rotating mirrors. So as the mirror scans. Um, so Landsat semantic mappers Okay, and the push broom scanners uh, for visible and near infrared. Array of sensor elements, so you just uh, scan, that, scan that. So that's for the satellite imaging, image formation. So for the, right, for the radar, so you have a real aperture radar in a microwave energy emitted across the track. Uh, amount of energy scattered. So this is a real amateur, and also SAR is also popular. It's called synthetic aperture like radar. So again, these things are very specialized, very expensive, and we are not going to use this one with the drone. However, SAR, SAR, as I know, uh, they they are miniaturized this SAR. Okay. Miniature this is our AR. So they will be able to see some hitting objects in the forest. So you park the uh, tank or vehicle within the forest, the SAR will be able to find you. Okay? <coughs> so when you have image, then we need to talk about uh, image in uh, uh, quantization. So the digital data. So the received energy is a continuous signal, it's an analog. It's continuous, and we need to quantize the splits uh, into di different discrete level. It's called digit. So the recorded levels are called DN, digital numbers, digital numbers. The downloaded to receiving a station when in view. So in terms of the bits, okay. So I guess you know what is the bits: eight bits, ten bits, twelve bits. And uh, then this is the different level of quantization steps, okay. 
upper and lower minutes, uh, not necessarily the linear, okay? Digital numbers in image converted back to the meaningful energy measure through calibration. So you only have dn is useless. So that's why people say you take, take a nice picture from the drone is useless because that is not even digital numbers. Okay? I'll elaborate on that. So you need calibration, then you will be able to tell the physical meaningful energy measure. Okay? So I just said that uh, in our regular camera, you take picture, the pixel value is not dn. Okay? It's useless. Why? It's not because it was not calibrated. It is because it was distorted. It's not reflecting the reflectance of the surface at all. So it is going through a very complicated internal mix or mixture. Therefore, that number is lost its reflectance value. So when you use a camera to do remote sensing to check the DN, you have to ask the manufacturer to provide the called raw format. So whoever doing a JPG or whatever format, image format, so this image, the digital number will be useless. So if you see some drone people using digital camera, get a pretty picture, and in this format, uh, they are trying to tell the crop health, that's pseudoscience. If they don't have access to the raw, they are 100% hobbyist. Okay? The first step you have to access the raw, okay? Otherwise, no. So there are some more technical details. Well, pixel is a digital number I talk about, about the importance of the raw. There is a dedicated format called raw, okay? Uh, you didn't do, so any JPG is through a very patented algorithm to mix all the pictures and neighboring things to form a pleasant, to please your eyes, okay? Uh, so the numbers inside these pictures are useless to infer the remote sensing uh, quantity. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, you, you need to convert. So you, you cannot convert them back to any meaningful energy measure at all. So be careful. Again, if nobody, if the guy didn't use raw, that's meaningless. That's hobbyist. So these are the concepts about uh, rows, columns, lines, samples, 3D, if we have more than one channel, dynamic range. So if you have multiple channels, you can even convert, uh, you, you have like red, blue, green, uh, RGB, so different channels. So, so then the data is no longer just an image, then it's a few images stacked together, we call it what? called a data cube, a data cube. So, so example applications, uh, visibly a near infrared and a mid wave infrared, and day only, no cloud cover. So what we do with this information is for vegetation among the dynamics, geologic mapping, mineral petroleum exploration, urban land use, uh, ocean uh, temperature, um, meteoro meteorology, ice sheet dynamics, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, the global most sensing example. This is a global map of the vegetation for MODIS instruments. Uh, you can check the MODIS from the NASA's website here. Okay. Um, and this is a, a remote sensing example 
for the global map of uh, sea surface temperature and uh, land surface reflectance from all these instruments. So you have a pretty uh, good idea about what's going on for the, the surface of the Earth at such large scale. Okay? And another example is use thermal infrared. So days and nights, a uh, rate of heating and cooling, then uh, heat loss, thermal plumes, uh, uh, pollution, Mapping of temperature, uh, forest fires, meteorology like cloud temperature and heights. And then if we use active microwave, so a microwave can penetrate the atmosphere condition, days and nights will work. So we can do the roughness of the surface erosion and water contents in the hydrology. Um, the centimeters of uh, several centimeters of the surface of anything like soil okay then see what's the water content the reflectance will be different of course vegetation structure leaf branch trunk they will be differentiated uh, digital elevation model is also also called DEM DEM and deformation volcano earthquake uh, and so on and so forth so uh, here, here's an example. You'll see this uh, Hokkaido, mountain Hokkaido, uh, using this uh, shuttle radar topographic mapping data. So you will be able to see the roughness of the mountain. Another one you will be able to see is uh, infra, Infoterra uh, um, to see at the uh, one meter resolution, one meter resolution of a city, okay? of the city. <coughs> and this is another company called Digital Globe will be able to tell you all the details of the city. And so here are more. So so this is a 0.5 meter resolution. That's amazing, right? 0.5 meters. So Basically, 0.5 meters, you will be able to see some details of the trees. 0.5 meters is like this, right? So, but again, you cannot see individual tree leaves. Okay? So you want, at that leaf level, you probably need a more high resolution data, like using a drone, okay? So there are lots of high-resolution commercial data galleries from uh, GOI here, Digital Globe in here. So take a look. But they all have limitations of resolution. Okay. Anyway, so let me pause and uh, ask you to think about this. Remote sensing depends on something called reflectance of some energy source, so for example, light, okay? Now, can you do remote sensing in the night? Possible, but you have to use expensive in other, in other wavelengths, like microwave, okay? But not visible, <laughs> it's dark in the night, so. Let's go back and think about this reflectance. <laughs> so reflectance is something in and something out, okay? You have some, so, so in radi radiance, the measurement of surface complicated by atmosphere. So the input solar radiation for passive optical, input from spacecraft uh, for active system like radar. So this reflectance, passive means you, you just you have sunshine. Or I have active sunshine, a laser like this one, laser pointer. I have active laser pointer. Then I see how much you reflect it back. Also talking about reflectance. Okay? So here is something, mechanisms. So incoming uh, EMR uh, reflected. So this is reflected, this is incoming, but those, those emitted EMR, meaning 
I don't have anything here, okay? But it's simply they have something emitted from it, emitted from it. So, then the light sensors will receive, will receive both reflected and emitted electromagnetic radiance, okay? So, this one also shows you, uh, uh, this is called atmospheric window, the transmission high, so can see through an atmosphere. So this is, those are windows. They're mostly opaque because of the water, okay? In this 100 meters, uh, mic 100 micrometers window, okay? This is a, this is the, the water we absorb, okay? And now, here are some of the uh, ozone, O3, and CO2. And so these are depending on the, depending on the atmosphere absorption behavior, okay? So to be able to see through the atmosphere, you have to use this, this, uh, this uh, white window. These I can see through, so this wavelengths. So this is already a proven science measured about this atmosphere property, okay? Uh, again, remember, this is infrared, okay? And the thermal property is in here, so visible in here, visible in here. In other words, the clouds will in this blue thing, clouds will uh, influence the uh, remote sensing reflectance here for sure. Okay, so cause of spectral variation in reflectance is by chemical structure properties. Okay, so for example, uh, uh, biochemical structural properties like chlorophyll concentration in vegetation. Okay, so you can imagine that the grass is very green versus grass very dry which is yellow, then the reflectance is different. On soil with different contents in their water, mineral, organic matters, they have uh, different properties, then the reflectance will be different. So I'm going to show you an interesting thing about vegetation response. So understand this one, we need to understand the wavelengths. So this wavelength here is visible, okay, the visible. Here is near infrared, and here is short wave infrared, SWIR. This is NIR. So then let's check about reflectance ratio. Reflectance ratio is uh, 100%. So this ratio actually defined in here, reflectance ratio, okay? Reflectance ratio. You have this amount in and this amount ref uh, reflected, okay? So that reflectance ratio is 50% reflect. So this reflectance is small, not so sensitive. However, suddenly, suddenly, when you do a near infrared, there's uh, something called red. This is red, okay? And uh, this is near red. So this part, what I'm, uh, my, my point, laser point, pointing, this part is called red edge. Red edge, okay? So that, there's actually a red edge is a brand for a camera. So, um, so this red edge will, will suddenly increase the sensitivity to the vegetation. So these are mainly for visible, you, you can tell the leaf pigments, okay? It's in good growing stage or not. Then this one, usually you can even use this one to tell the cell structure, okay, cell structure. And uh, inside in this range, uh, then you will be able to see a lot of water absorptions, okay? Water contents. So these are the dominating factors that control the leaf reflectance, okay? All right, so, so basically, remote sensing will focus on these three bands, visible, near infrared, short wave infrared for agricultural applications. So here is an, uh, here is something called soil reflectance. So this is wavelength again, the reflectance percentage. 
So this is a water absorption band in here. This is a, a water absorption band again, and this is a, a hydrophobe absorption bands. So this is the percentage of the water. Uh, sorry, a percentage of the, uh, the, the, the soil, okay? So with different percentage of the water in the soil, the behavior of this reflectance is so different, which is a good sign. We can tell the contents in the water, water contents. Well, so we talk about, this is so far the passive we use the solar uh, radiance. But what if we use radar? Meaning, I purpose the beam, the beam uh, giving wavelengths to this one. Then you have a reflectance. Then you have something received, transmit and receive. Okay. So I'm not going to elaborate on this because we don't use radar a lot. Okay. So with different radar images like this, you are able to see different surface behaviors, surface behaviors, okay? And uh, those radar mechanisms, I'm not going to talk about it. Scattering mechanisms, depending on the roughness and topology of the surface. So, so we can use that one to tell vegetation amount, change in the canopy, cover over time, and varying property of soil, degradation. So you have A, B, C in here, a is bare soil, is a full cover, and senescence, uh, okay? So this is something, uh, change detection. So in, in a place, it's originally, can check next one. Read it carefully. Did you see some changes? So that 11 years later, you see this area is changing, okay? Previously, it's not much, so it's changing. And then, after another uh, six years, you'll see uh, it was different uh, uh, structures in here. The soil uh, changes, vegetation changes. So use this information, um, mapping the leaves, area index called RAI, RAI or canopy cover, uh, discrete variables like spectral representation of the cover type, do the classification, so um, we'll be able to manage the urban evolution to do the planning in a better way. Okay. So <clears throat> here's another uh, leaf area index. Uh, wavelength is like this. This is a near infrared. This is a visible. Uh, this is a reflectance factor uh, percentage. So in the bare soil is the red one. Okay, bare soil is the red one. Uh, so you, at different times, you different arrow uh, leaf arrow index. The higher meaning the is growing, the, the thriving. So you can see different time, June, July, August, you can see the grow in a very different way. Okay, very different way. different way. So in other words, we should be able to tell the, how the crop grows at different stages based on this reflectance behavior. Okay, so uh, here is uh, Leaf area index in Africa, okay? So you will be able to see September and December. September is in here, December uh, is in here. So September has much better coverage. This is uh, not much, okay? And also we can do other coverage. Uh, so this is uh, 1973 of, of this region of different like forest and non-forest, water, uh, this is the water, uh, clouds, uh, cloud shader, okay, cloud shader. So you, ha you can compare this one and this one, what's the difference? Okay. So it's less 
the green areas, the, the forest is reducing, is reducing. So with that, we can do spectrum curves, the features like red edge, I told you red edge, using scatter plot, two channel information, and color compositions, and do enhancement, enhancement, uh, meaning you use some normalization procedure. So NDVI, you have to know this, so NDVI. So it's a normalized, normalized, difference vegetation index. Okay, index, NDVI. This is uh, in the satellite remote sensing area. This was invented. That was invented to sharpen the information. That's called enhancement. Okay. Is a near infrared minus red divided by near infrared plus infrared. Okay. Uh, plus red, okay. I'll show you that one later on, okay. So those vi visualization, you can do uh, spectrum, absorptance features, information type, concentration of absorption, so and so on and so forth, okay. So here is uh, color composition, choose three channels, information, not just RGB, you can do some other uh, com uh, uh, composition, okay, okay? The force colored uh, composition and so on and so forth, force color. And then it will help you to interpret the data very well. So for example, this is uh, visualization to analysis, standard force color composition. Uh, then you, you have a rough idea about this region but sometimes uh, it's a good idea to use red reflectance and near infrared reflectance to show this different scatter plots. And uh, so this NDVI at a different level, you have different section in here, and you will be able to differentiate the cotton, uh, corn, soil, alfalfa, alfa, wheat. You can see they live in a different sections, okay? So that's very useful for classification. So this vegetation indices uh, is in the, what they call red and near infrared space, okay? So you turn this picture, okay, turn this picture into this picture. It's another representation, okay? Another representation. And here's another one. So this is a red and near infrared. Uh, so then you can, you can try to draw vegetation approach enhancement. Um, another idea is to do an enhanced response to vegetation. Minimize the response to extraneous factors like soil. The soil is considered as disturbing our interpretation. So hopefully we can maintain a linear relationship. And uh, so one of the idea is to do ratio indices, angular measure, and the other one is to do perpendicular indices is a parallel line. So this is one of the ideas, okay? So we have seen this one, and we draw this line, okay? And DVI is uh, zero, they are the same. Or we use this line, okay? And DVI is this, so use this line. And or do this, or this, or this. So this is called uh, enhancement using a uh, ratio. So what they do is NIR divided by red channel, it will give you RVI, it's called ratio vegetation index. Come on, if I ask you what is ratio vegetation index, you should tell me immediately. Near infrared, divided by red, okay? And what is the NDVI? I told you is near infrared minus red and near, divided by near infrared plus red. 
So you should know this one as well, NDVI, okay, NDVI. So the question is, uh, let's see an enhancement. Vegetation index is like this. So this is a false color, you don't see it very well. So the vegetation is in a, is in a red, it's a false color, okay? Okay, false color. But it's not very sharp, and it, it, so it's a good idea we just do difference, normalize the difference of vegetation. So in this case, all these bright spots are vegetation. All dark black is non-vegetation. It's consistent to this, but this is much clearer. Okay? So NDVI is a very useful uh, index, widely used. Okay, widely used. So I'll go a little bit faster. Enhancement. So people say, oh yeah, let's do the parallel lines. And then uh, we can do perpen perpendicular indices. So it's called a perpendicular vegetation index and soil adjust savvy, soil adjusted vegetation index. So these are another category of vegetation indexes called perpendicular indices. So, um, so these are all ideas. So let me show you uh, illustration of the smoke correcting property of a savvy. So you, because this isn't a smoke, so uh, it's affecting our uh, judgment of uh, NDVI and judgment of the vegetation. So we need to uh, correct that. So this uh, perpendicular vegetation index will really help us, okay, will help us. So far, everything we learned is regarding remote sensing using satellites, okay? There are standard techniques in there. There's a huge amount of literature in there. But our role is how we can use remote sensing using small unmanned aircraft systems. So if, yeah, in the next 20 slides, we'll make a stop and have a rest, okay? So this is what we contributed, okay? So we promote the US-based remote sensing like this. So this is our Vernapur, in fact, uh, near the campus, the Vernapur, the reserve area, grassland and reserve area. So why we need to use UAV-based remote sensing is very low cost, high spatial resolution, okay? And uh, what, what is the high resolution? At the centimeter level, okay, centimeter level. Uh, but disadvantages is endurance is low. It's not like satellites there forever. <laughs> endurance maybe one hour, maybe 20 minutes. And payload, you cannot carry very heavy things in there. But that doesn't mean it's not possible, oh. okay? So we can use remote sensing in different uh, bands, like near infrared, red, green, blue, thermal infrared. So these are the same field and uh, showed up in a different spectra. So you can see that. And also you from here, you will be able to see um, how the crops are doing, okay, in a different, different uh, plots. So Using a drone to do remote sensing makes sense of the scientific data. There should be a, a remote sensing workflow. So in this one here, uh, so we are trying to extract the information from data collected. So flying the drone is only in this small box. So it's called a mission. Mission planning, uh, mission operation, and field data collection. So a big chunk in here is data processing. And then we need to do analysis. So in the processing, we can show you that we're also doing image retrieval, image metadata parsing, raw band separation, 
and lens correction. We're going to need to do lens calibration and flat field calibration using vignette correction and uh, radiometric calibration and also rectification and more psyching. So we need to use some ground control points to enhance our mosaicing frequency, uh, accuracy, uh, uh, and band-to-band -band registration, and band stacking, okay? With all data processing workflow, then you have a scientific grade information, okay? But that is not the end of the story, so you pass to the next stage to do the analysis. In analysis, you have post-processing analysis, uh, reflectance calculation, digital surface modeling, and the image classification. Okay, so that is what we call sen uh, remote sensing workflow using drones. So to do the planning, we first ask the question, what do you need? Okay, so are you going to do video recording or you just do still imagery? How fast do you need the information? Okay, and how big is the area you want to coverage? Okay, and uh, image resolution, what is the smallest thing you need to see? Time constraints, how long do you need to stay in the air? And money constraints, how much money do you have to spend on this. So all these questions we need to answer, you need, we need to ask before we have a planning of uh, research. But next step is about challenging. In efficient methodology, collect the best data we can get, hope that we collect something of value. So accurate data is possible, but only after multiple rounds of calibration and correction. So try and error a lot. So how much of the data is actually used. So it's not really, um, uh, we need a lot. So what is the efficient methodology? What are the missing technological analysis gaps? So we are trying to bring out our key contribution in this field is when we do it, we need to talk about how well we are doing it. That is, is this best, or is this optimal? So we talk about optimality, okay, or optimality. So bring this thinking into remote sensing using small air, I mean aircraft, we are the first, okay? So under investigation can be characterized by aggregate those features, characteristics, and scales must exist a measure how how good is considered as good, the best representation of the entity. So in light of the necessary uh, workflow steps to obtain the information, we need to exam examine what the optimal measurements and how a UAV is able to achieve that. That's the key concept. So even if you're running a company, you have a lot of money, and you do the remote sensing, okay? You need to ask yourself quiet, quietly, are we doing it in a smart way? Is this optimal? Okay, can we further improve it? And that kind of question. So here is something academic. So we first, to answer this question, or first to abstract in a mathematic description, so so this is a domain of interest, DOI, in R2, meaning the two-dimensional. Uh, any uh, poly, uh, polygon define an area of interest. So you have a band density function N, so the band density function N lambda, which is a function of Q. Q is a point in this 2D domain, okay? So this is the kind of band density so th there is also spectral response at any of the point and of the size of the delta square uh, at any time t1 to t2 t uh, t and with wavelength lambda. So lambda is a wavelength, okay? In any of the wavelengths, any of the point, 
then there is a function. So we assume we know that eta. We are using math abstraction, but basically uh, I showed you lots of reflectance picture. So remember we have picture like this. So this is lambda wavelengths. Okay. So this is reflectance. That's one hundred percent. This is one hundred. So you always have something like this. Okay. So in here, this is a red. This is near infrared. Okay. So, so that kind of. Uh, so this function, this function, is eta. Okay. Density function. Uh, spectral response. Uh, the usefulness of this mapping is dependent on the proper selection of spatial resolution delta. So delta is a spatial resolution. The size of the spatial is the minimum. Is this is called domain of interest, which is omega. So omega. Inside omega, there is a minimum. Is a delta by delta. Delta square. There is a minimum point. So because you cannot see something smaller than this, okay. So. We have three things we need to remember, okay? Three things. So the first thing is delta. It's minimum resolution in here. The second thing is lambda, is the wavelength, depending on what camera, camera you want to use. Another one is T. So these three things, okay? Given this, we know that we, suppose we can choose delta, lambda, T arbitrarily, there must be uh, the best combination of them, okay? So, now how we can tell uh, what is considered as good? So, we, we need to define some J. J is considered as uh, performance measure, performance metric. Uh, so, uh, we can keep talking this way, uh, how much cost and what's the performance. So, minimize that. Minimize cost, maximize performance then you make this one minimize, okay? And phi is kind of initial boundary conditions, okay? And uh, so then the cost is uh, uh, many factors, okay, many factors. Performance is also many factors. So we just use a mathematical formulation. So the result, it becomes uh, aggregate all these factors together, okay, together. So, <coughs> so you, you may feel this discussion is something uh, too mathematical. Let me use plain languages, okay? All right, so we have three components in here. Let me repeat. We need to carefully select the spatial, spectral, and temporal. So this is a, spa so this is a spatial is delta, okay? Lambda is spectral, T is temporal components, conduct remote sensing applications in the optimal, uh, optimal sense, optimal sense. Um, okay, so first of all, you take a look of the spatial resolution. So you have uh, the same place, but you have different resolution. So. Uh, terrain modeling of vegetation index. What are the benefits of this improvements in spatial resolution? Why would it be necessary? Okay, uh, can we uh, can the information safely compressed or or lost? So this spatial resolution, okay, uh, ACM versus 34 cm resolution. So they clearly are different. Okay, but is this really needed? So if you say, oh yeah, actually 50 centimeter will be enough, then why bother you go eight centimeter? You overkill the problem, right? It's unnecessarily accurate. So next one is uh, uh, another example you show that uh, eight centimeter you can see quite well uh, features compared to 34. And the land set is 30 meters resolution, each pixel is 30 meters, while uh, 13 meters using drone is three times better. 
So how does this relate to optimization? Uh, so you have uh, performance-wise, yeah, the higher resolution, the better, okay? But downside is uh, you, you have uh, lower coverage area, slow flight speed, but if you want to increase coverage area, high altitude, the wide span, so these are com it's conflicting, right? Conflict. So that is called uh, spatial resolution, okay? Next one is called spectral resolution, okay? Spectral resolution. So spectral resolution meaning this is the wavelengths. They have each red, green, blue, and NIR. So they have a different spectral response window like that. So this is not narrow band. This is naturally like that. So we, we actually can get this data from using different calibration board. We have this checkboard, chessboard. To take picture, then we'll come out this to understand how this uh, is doing the spectral response. So, but what is considered as the best wavelengths? Okay, so there are so many wavelengths. I don't know which one I should use. So then there is, a, this is a very important slide. Okay, huh. Okay, so when you only have a blue, what do you can see? What do you only have green? What do you can do? What do you have red? What do you can really do? And the red edge, so this is red edge, okay? You see my laser point? This is a red edge. The red is here, uh, different numbers, and near infrared is here, okay? And several different bands. They can tell you different meaning, different possible use. So depending on the mission, you should pick up all these bands carefully, okay? But, the special resolution, I told you, this one is, see, this is a wavelength, this is absorption rate, sensitivities. So if I go from here, uh, this is a very wide band, okay, wide band. And now, this is a very narrow band, can you see that, can you see that? So, and this is a regular uh, camera, we can buy very cheap, 100 bucks, but this, if they have need to have very sharp response, then you pay a lot of money, okay? So question is, can this is robust to sensor inaccuracies, user errors, or environmental effects? And now, should we use a narrow band? Can we trust it? So it's, there is an optimal choice there, okay? So you don't want to spend too much money to, to request this very sharp. And probably only 100 bucks you can get this. So, and calibration is very important. And for example, we did a calibration for soil moisture measurements. This is the drinking cup, plastic cup with different soil, with different level of water. So we measure the volume, volumetric water contents and with uh, the reflectance, and we use different types of wavelengths, okay? So you can see the sensitivity level is different. Right, it's different. So that is spatial resolution, spectral resolution, okay? Next one is spatial resolution, spectral resolution, and next one is temporal resolution. So if you go to the, this is our Vernapur, right? So in one year, how many flights do you need? How often you need to? So you fly every day, is this really needed? Every week, or every month, every four months, or every six months? So this is like every six months, you have a one is, <laughs> well, is green, one is brown, right? This doesn't tell you too much about how the vulnerability is changing over time, so probably you need something more often than that. But if you fly every day, probably it's not needed. 
But what is the real frequency we need? This is called temporal resolution. So when you get out, you need to really ask these three questions. Spatial resolution, spectral resolution, and temporal resolution. Okay? So this is a, a very interesting idea. So these black dots are just uh, uh, the sand grain uh, cranes. And uh, in the night, we fly a thermal camera. And we'll check all these black dots. Uh, just each one is a, a sleeping crane. Okay? But the question is, getting this picture is not easy from distance above. You know? Then we do this precision bird counting. Never happened before. We are the first achieving that. Okay? So then we need to talk about we need to talk about temporal resolution. How often and what's the best timing to fly? Such that the water temperature and the body temperature of the bird have a maximum contrast. So you will be able to see them. So, so we implement this idea of optimal remote sensing will bring us to uh, the best resolution we can count to the birds. So another thing to talk about it, okay. Another thing to talk about it, remote sensing is application dependent challenge. No one solution will work for all cases. But having an optimality question in mind will definitely help you, okay? Will help you, okay? And uh, so let me, let me show you another example, okay? So this is done by my former PhD student, Christoph Tricot. Uh, we call it optimal remote sensing. So you have a drone flying here you have drone flying here, and there is a ground motion uh, movement going. So I want to fly, so I want to fly just to the best spot possible. Meaning, if I, if, this is my domain of interest, this is a ground, say for example, I have a ground movements of pests, okay? I want to spray them, okay? I want to spray them. So I want to hit them in the best spot possible. So you can see I have a footprint. My footprint is always capturing the, the, the center, bullseye, <laughs> all right? So, so the remote sensing, doing this way, will be able to optimally locate itself such that this remote sensing footprint will bring back the most interesting results. It's always in the center, okay? On the other hand, lots of people in industry is calling, oh, we just do a sweeping of the area. Coverage, I call this is brutal force coverage sweeping approach. That should be avoided probably you don't have to cover every inch. You only cover certain critical area representative. That's enough. So this movie just shows you this idea. And we're solving lots of equations behind this. So this is called optimal remote sensing. So you only, f you only fly a path. You don't have to do the coverage. Don't you see that? So that's called smart remote sensing. Not brute force coverage, okay? Sweeping and coverage. So our theoretical work can work for one drone, also can work for two drones. You can see we have two drones, two footprints, and we have three drones, okay? So these are very interesting research questions, okay? Could one day put in the practical use. So I hope you will be able to uh, read and browsing all this literature in the traditional uh, remote sensing using satellites. And 
I am also hope you can check the, our web and tutorial uh, from uh, NASA's website and some other. Uh, so these are the pointers for you to read more. And also um, free data sources on the web. And uh, we can take 10 minutes break. We'll come back again. OK? OK. So we started at the 9.30. We f stopped at 11.30. We spent 30 minutes on the final exam. I hope you get uh, the message. So, what's your, uh, this one? Okay, let me try. Chen? Justin. 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 Parado, Kevin, Joseph. Yeah, get yours back. And uh, here's today's quiz. We already got on. There are two people didn't show up. Did you get this? Yes. Okay, good. So, did you get a certificate of your drone flying? Oh, yeah, RC. Yeah, yeah. I really guess. <laughs> uh, there's a signature from me as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good thing that my capstone is, we, we made the PowerPoint 30 minutes before our presentation. Oh my gosh. It's no problem.
Unfortunately, I don't, but it's in the Mesa lab, you can find somebody. <laughs> I can go find it. If you have to give me permission to run around, sure. You can. Knock the door. Go. Oh. Is this serious? This is something stupid again. Something going on in, uh, in your lab today? No, 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 no. It's the castle power supply sometimes like this. Not always, but uh, occasionally. Somebody is touching something. Hmm. You hear a dull thud in the distance. <laughs> The wireless is off. The projector should be on. You have a question? Yes. So, for the... For the proposal, uh -huh. we submitted it, and then we got a 20 out of 25. But, is it because of this? Because in the comment, Bo put that... <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't define. No, because <laughs> we just answered everything here. Like, this is our proposal, mm -hmm. um, right here. Mm -hmm. Because we put our roles mm -hmm. on the... Presentation and the mm, final. Not on this one. No, but like uh, we put everything. Can can you can you ask Bo to reconsider? <laughs> I didn't grade this. Oh, okay. So ask Bo. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. It, yeah, it's not on the requirements. Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 Yeah, nah. So don't, don't worry. Tomorrow? Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah. We'll ask Bo tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. He will. He will be here today. For today. Yeah. Afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Mm.
then I'm not sure if my, my sister was serious about it, but she said that she bet with someone who had like six months' salary that we couldn't find a home for it. I'm like, why would you do that? Oh no, the bet was that we would end up keeping it rather than finding it. I don't think that. We already have quite a fine bet. We don't need another one. Like it's cute and all, but. That's where you're wrong, Joe. Oh, yeah. yeah. I know I'm not doing It's like bad enough to handle five dogs. I like, I got to do that. It's like that. It's like this one. And it's like, I think it's like almost a tuxedo. It's like black with white like, like, like coloring. Well, right now it's kind of brownish. It sounds like a pretty pretty cat, actually. Yeah, well, she's small. Like, she, my pillow is heavy. But, plus, uh, we think it's a rent, too, on top of that. Because, like, there are other kids nearby, and they were, like, we get them out bigger. I know, uh, my high school counselor, uh, she lives in a car, and she, there are these cats that are out there that there's like, a mom that always left her babies, and so we got one of those cats and we got these cats. Just a little weird going on the cats, those cats though, because he doesn't get out because he's parking on the rear cat. Yeah, she's a little noisemaker, albeit she's not that loud. Okay, we should continue. Uh, I don't know, there's so many, like, I don't know, my sister was there. That was like the only one that looked like really dying. That's it. Okay, welcome back. <laughs> I'll let you go in 20 minutes. How about that? But we need to talk about privacy. You have a drone in hand, it's a privilege. You should respect other people's privacy. There's some practice, it's related to the drone uh, operation, whether you can continue or being sustainable or not. Okay? So that is. Um, what we need to discuss about privacy and the drones. And I have uh, maybe 10 slides to go through with you. So let's start from here. Uh, I told you that uh, I gave a talk. Hmm. Searching for a signal. And I don't think it's doing the right work. Okay, you don't have to search. No signal. Interesting, let me do something. Let's do HTML.
It's because of the power problem. going on so but it's working now uh, remember I shared with you that four years ago I was invited to give a talk in Castle Air Museum and I was envisioning that people will line up and protest my uh, seminar but that didn't happen so it's well received because I give the message that the drones can be uh, our uh, good assistant, especially in the Central Valley. I shared with them the Central Valley's uh, precision agriculture applications and environmental monitoring. But at that time, I think uh, this most important thing is the privacy question, uh, whether the drone you fly will, uh, will, will, will cause my privacy issue. <laughs> okay, yeah, you will um, breach um, my privacy. Say, for example, uh, you uh, fly on top of my backyard and uh, on top of my swimming pool or, or whatever. Um, so spying on me. Then I, at that time, I used an analogy saying that if some, if your neighbor really wants to uh, uh, spy on you. He can put, uh, he can tape uh, the iPhone on a stick. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you get the point? It's not the drone. It's the, it's the guy who used the drone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. So. So, but however. We don't worry about somebody will take an iPhone and start to uh, spy on me, and you know. So, <sighs> but there are interesting frameworks that we need to consider. Okay, so I'll spend maybe. Twenty minutes on this topic. Privacy concerns, okay? Privacy concerns. So, in 2012, it's actually very uh, new at that time regarding uh, privacy by design. A Canadian scientist uh, prepared a document. Uh, he, uh, she is an uh, information and privacy commissioner prepare this PBB, PBD, Privacy by Design concept for UAVs. So the PBD is to solve the privacy issues in the age of drones. I believe this is good, this is good. So there is a series of uh, recommendations made by this document. Uh, some of the main ways privacy may be protected in this new age of unmanned error systems. Okay. So, what we should do is to make public debate. Okay. Meaning, we should conduct with relevant stakeholders in instances where the UAVs may be used to capture personal information or personal identifiable information. Um, including uh, accidentally uh, footages in order to examine the necessity of any proposed UAV programs and if any policies are required to ensure its acceptability to the public to the public so this is a debate let's talk about it what do you really care what, what you really don't care 
what are the scenarios you care most, and so on and so forth, like backyard, uh, swimming pool, okay, thing like that. Um, flying on top of person is actually not allowed, okay? It's not because of the privacy, it's because of the liability, okay? So uh, you need to have a liability on that. Um, so give you an example. We flew in a real neighborhood in uh, Maryland. Uh, it's, um, the neighborhood is about 20 neighborhoods. They fly the drones, check the leak of the methane, okay, the, the natural gas, okay. Um, the BGNAE is a Baltimore gas and electricity company put us in mixture with their crew and uh, informing that the neighborhoods saying that we are doing a regular check but this time we add a drone component in there but I guarantee you that we follow all the procedures and by the way there's no camera on the drone so people don't mind that uh, the drones will sniff the possible leaking methane or natural gas while, re re while it may potentially uh, damage your privacy. <laughs> so probably it's not a concern. So that communication is important. So this one called public debate, I would like to say public communication. Okay, the communication is important. Everybody knows everything. There's no hidden agenda, okay? okay? The next one is, next recommendation step is privacy impact assessment, okay, called PIA. So then we need to understand pros and cons, especially the consequences of what if something is violated. So PIA can uh, give us, uh, allow us to uh, have a systematic exam of this impacts and associated benefits involving deploying the UAVs. So I have to tell you something actually, if you believe that your GPS coordinates of, your, of yourself uh, is a private information you don't want to leak this one to others and don't others to accept the whereabouts about you, okay, don't track your GPS coordinates. But sometimes it's useful if you get lost and people can find you. So there's pros and cons, that's why impacts and, uh, and impacts and the benefits, okay. So before engaging in an activity that involves UAV, we should make a PIA uh, assessment should be conducted of the fact that the proposed UAV system may have on personal privacy and the ways in which any adverse effects can, can be mitigated. By examining the collection, use, disclosure, and retention of personal information and how we did this uh, life cycle of the data. So what if we, uh, you say that, oh, I collect the data then I destroy the data. I only keep the essence of, say for example, NDVI, N, uh, NDVI information. So all others will be lost. Uh, by the way, crops will not, the trees will not shout at you regarding their privacy, right? So, but what if there's some farmers working there or some um, guest workers in the field they don't want people to know, right? But we don't keep those information, we only keep NDVI, so what? So the kind of impact assessment should be included about how the information was used, or collected, so that kind of thing. I just give you just a simple scenario regarding that. You agree? So this is the second part. The third part is the transport regulations. So privacy policy should be prepared, incorporated into all training orientation programs of the users and the service providers. 
So that means you as a future drone workforce member, so you have to be aware of the privacy. So if you any of your nice, beautiful drone mission planning, and you never mention a word privacy, that doesn't make you really look professional. Okay, so that's why I make you aware. Of course, liability and insurance is uh, is uh, another part. So um, when you run a business, you have to talk about insurance. Who is going to pick up the liability? But as a UC student, your liability and the insurance is automatically covered as long as you follow the rules. That's why we need to check whether you know the rules. So that's why we need to practice the registration, the, the, the fire and the fly procedures. Okay. So this talking about Canada, but in the United States is the same. For practical flight operations, certificate to comply with a privacy protection program, naming a responsible privacy officer in a US using organization. So you need to have somebody uh, in your company future, you can have another position opened, not just CEO, CTO, CFO, you have like a CPO, Chief Privacy Officer, right? That will make your uh, company look more professional. Is that right? But people, there's another word, it's called compliance. So in a, com in a corporate setting, like UC Merced, there's a dedicated full-time person in charge of research compliance. Meaning you do research, cross campus, guarantee that everybody is in compliance to uh, all the federal and local uh, rules, okay? Regulation. So here is FAA regulation, part 107, okay? And usage restrictions should be placed using organization like your company to the extent of personal information they may collect about identifiable individuals. So, uh, <coughs> so we need to have a general restrictions like don't fly uh, on top of people and don't, re don't have the information of any identifiable individuals, okay? That should be put in the restriction. So, so here's the one, privacy by design, okay? Privacy design is rather than taking a privacy compliance approach to system design, organizations should take a proactive, proactive privacy by design approach to uh, the developing and operating UAV program uh, with, which respects privacy, okay? okay? So awareness is the first place. So the reason I add this part into this ending section of the class is to make you aware of this. Because if otherwise, you probably will be uh, unintentionally violating other people's privacy, okay? okay. So be careful. So this will ensure that the proposed design and operation of the UAV system limits privacy intrusion, and if any, to which is absolutely necessary to achieve required lawful goals. So you need to adjust those goals, redo the planning. So I believe that long time ago, I believe that uh, we have enough wisdom to solve the privacy issue, just the way we are using the iPhones, everybody today, to trade off the privacy issues. So you, you cannot um, ignore it, but you cannot say, because of that, we should stop, you know. So we should solve it actively. So again, privacy by design is a good framework to make you um, overcome this potential issue of privacy, okay? So with that, I can stop here. Any questions about privacy? Okay, go ahead. Yes.
Okay, so I know that Google Street, uh, they had some strange captures of people's strange behaviors, and uh, I, I, I know that. So that is a problem. It is still a problem. But I think the technology is, is coming uh, to remove uh, this, say, this, this word. It's called uh, personal as uh, identifiable individuals. So there's a, there's a, they are developing, I think it's mature the technology that even if there's people in the, in the Google Street View, there's a way to uh, blur that so it's not individually identifiable. So that's the technology. Or you just remove them automatically. So there are, computer algorithms that can detect whether in the picture there is a human there. And if yes, we can remove it as if it never existed. So all this technology is possible right now. Okay. And I was thinking about a camera that can automatically remove any people in the picture. It's a purely environmental, no human. Uh, then that happened at uh, not software level, but hardware level. So you take picture, although uh, you have a lot of people in the room, but uh, they remove all of them. Just so that kind of technology is actually possible. Uh, and if we, we can reinforce that for all the drone cameras, okay, the cameras used in the drone, they must have that hardware level filtering of all the human in there, okay, or re remove the face. <laughs> okay. and so anyway, those personal identifiable information can be handled if we are aware of the privacy issue, okay? So other questions? And other questions about final exam? Or final few days. I, I think we have four until Thursday, right? Yeah, but the final is on Wednesday. Final is Wednesday, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. But um, Thursday we still have lab. Oh, okay. So okay. Uh, tomorrow's lab is going to be here as well. Or is tomorrow's lab? What are we doing? For the, for the uh, lab? I think it's a vernal pool. Yeah. The weather was good, yeah. and it will be good. Are you going to have a canopy out there in the room pools? Or we have, we have canopy. Okay, good. We'll bring canopy. I'll ask them to bring canopy. Because I know personally. I'm, I'm meeting, I'm meeting them. No, meeting Bo no, and... Uh, <laughs> there's no shade. You guys yeah, I know, I know. I know. Yeah, I know. We'll, we'll bring it. <laughs> yeah, it's tough, I know. Uh, tomorrow, I'll try to meet you guys there. Oh. Will there be lots of batteries available for us to work with? with we will charge and prepare a, a, a lots of batteries. So Many? More than you need. You underestimate. <laughs> Underestimate. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to uh, spend six full weeks with everyone. And uh, expect the, the, the final exam is uh, uh, not stressful. But you really need to enhance that part, okay? You need to enhance this thing. Do you get it? Yeah, so you'll ask us like a second order or third order differential? Or? Uh, no, I cannot tell you that. Okay. So, <laughs> no, no, no. It will, it will be harder than this one and the one I showed you, of course. Uh, no, 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 actually harder than that, so. Uh, uh, <laughs> We're gonna cry. <laughs> How do you solve PDEs? We cry. Uh, any uh, final questions? Uh, what would you recommend that we do in the next 48 hours in regards to the mental uh, You sleep only eight hours. Other than that, you just read. Don't eat. <laughs> don't eat. Okay. No eat. Don't sleep. And uh, yeah, when when absolutely needed. You, you sleep and, uh, and eat. And panic, right? Uh, no, 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 no. Final exam is, actually I showed you, it's, it's supposed to be 
uh, a way to guide you where you put your energy and read more and be prepared. So I, what I see, there are two things you need to know. One is Simulink, OS4. OS4 Simulink. Another one is GNC, okay? A GNC, these two parts, I probably, the emphasis you should spend in the next 48 hours. All other parts probably is easy. So, and the new acronyms you should remember. Okay, with All that. Uh, party? All of the quizzes are up already on the CAC courses? Uh, see, I didn't get that. Are all of the quizzes on CAC courses already, or do we have to look over all quizzes? Yeah, the, all, the, all the quizzes will be in the CAC course. There's a directory for that. So I purposely didn't put homework last week. This is because I want you to spend more time on your final project. And yeah, this is mechatronics? Sort of, yeah, and also you, you, you signed up for Mechtronics, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's all. I'll, I'll be here this afternoon, I'll be here. Actually, none of you will stay for any uh, further office hour. Um, I'll be here in the afternoon, I'll be here tomorrow.